welcome to uh, the Smithsonian, welcome to the Fierce Sackler um, space, welcome to the Myers Auditorium. I'm very happy that you're here this evening. My name is Eduardo Diaz, I'm the director of the Latino Center here at the Smithsonian, and we're one of the uh, sponsoring organizations of, of, this evening's, uh, of this evening's program. I uh, want to, first of all, thank Conrad Ng and the staff of the Asian Pacific American Program <clears throat> here at the Smithsonian. Uh, they are our principal crime partners in this uh, endeavor, and this is the first crime that, um, that we are officially in cahoots with. So at least now you know who to arrest if things get um, out, of, out of control. I want to thank Ronald Wideman uh, of our staff, of the, of the uh, Latino Center staff, for working uh, principally with Gina Inocencio, um, who works at APAP for putting uh, the program together. I mentioned that this is a, a pilot event <clears throat> of a larger, excuse me, collaborative project we lovingly and purposefully have called Unruly Crossings. Uh, it's sort of a rethinking, or at least an attempt to rethink Asian and Latino uh, America. Um, during this process, and this is again the first part of this program, we can, it's gonna kind of be a rolling program, um, which I think is the way it should be really, because so, so much of our relationship, that is to say the relationship between Latinos and Asians in the United States is iterative, so such so should be our program, I think. Uh, we'll be looking at shared histories and connections, collaborations, and of course collisions, and uh, we will uh, certainly look at how all of that dynamic plays out in the arts, like film, for example, or like how we are imaged uh, in the internet. Um, and so tonight is a great way to start this out because I do think it's a, it's a way to really get a visual example, a very palpable way of looking at how our communities have been portrayed and perhaps how we even portray ourselves. Um, rather, and, and, and part of the, the, of the poetry which I really like is, um, and um, uh, Pawan's here from APAP, who I think really put it very nicely uh, in the way in which we look at this as in relationship to each other rather than as independent of each other. And I think that's really key because I think what happens in this country so often is we become segmented, um, we become sort of segregated and oh, that's that ethnic group and oh, that's that other ethnic group. And it's like we don't have a shared history. Well, obviously we do if you go back to even to the colonial trade routes that existed for 250 years between Mexico and, and the Philippines, the Manila Galleons, for example, well, that 250 years set into, set into motion uh, a process that continues to evolve, and that's kind of the process we're gonna continue to look at as we go forward. So how Asians and Latinos in this country use one another as reference points as they construct their economic, cultural, family and other types of lives, as well as our shared history, that's what's going to be uh, at stake. That's what's going to be our focus as we move forward. We're gonna have a lot of fun doing this, I, like I hope we have today, and so you presenters better have, better be lively. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of fun. Obviously we're gonna uh, probably make some missteps, probably piss off some people, but you know, that's, then that's our job, I think. I, I think our job is to push some things and push a few envelopes here and there and, and have fun. And Conrad, he looks very shy, but he's, uh, yeah, he's a pretty dynamic guy. So he's gonna, I think, be with us as we uh, continue to unravel and, and uh, unwrap the onion, as they say. So thank you for being part of this journey of discovery. We're very pleased that you're part of it. By the way, I should note that uh, APAP is tweeting live, not like I know what that means, but if you do that, uh, you need to use hashtag pound different POV. I have absolutely no idea what that means, uh, but those of you who tweet and are on Twitter uh, will know what that means, so I encourage you to do what you feel like you need to do to, to, to stay tuned and alive with this program. And also, by the way, let me just remind you, to, I know you all have these cell phones, so you might want to look at it now and make sure that it's, that it's off. So. Thank you again, welcome to the Smithsonian, and now it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome uh, to the stage for the uh, introduction of our speakers this evening, Conrad Ng, the director of the Asian Pacific American Program here at the Smithsonian, thank you.
Well, uh, good evening, everyone. And as uh, Ido has uh, introduced himself, he's a, he's a dear man. I'm very glad to count him as a colleague. Uh, certainly, Wes, uh, we think about our respective missions, the Smithsonian Latino Center and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Program. You know, our task uh, is certainly to make sure that uh, the Smithsonian includes people like us, and it already does, but we have to make an effort to make sure that we're recognized. Um, but what's interesting is the enthusiasm um, in which we also recognize that our stories include each other. Right? So when we look at our intersections and the ways in which we define ourselves uh, in relationship to other communities. So we have a, an exciting, I think, collaboration that's just beginning, uh, and this is our start. Uh, to launch a, a new conversation about how it is that the Nations Museum includes the kinds of conversations that we're having tonight. So I'm glad that you're here to be part of that. So I have the, the pleasure of introducing our speakers um, and read uh, biographies that um, are, are very humbling in the sense that you think, well, I thought I was doing something with my life. Uh, these guys are. Um, you know, the, tonight, the, the format of the evening will pretty much uh, go like this. I'll um, introduce uh, one speaker, uh, Charles Ramirez Berg, uh, first, and then our second, and who will then uh, give his talk, uh, and then I'll introduce Lisa Nakamura, our second uh, speaker, uh, who will then give her talk, and then we'll have a, a conversation, as it were, on the stage, but we're hoping to include uh, you, right? So I do uh, think about some of the questions uh, that may emerge from the presentations, um, but, but come hopefully with a spirit of inquiry, I mean, because I think that's what's going to make um, what we're trying to do uh, tonight uh, special. So please, ask questions. So let me begin with the introduction. Uh, Charles Ramirez Berg is the University Distinguished Teaching Professor in the Department of Radio, Television, and Film at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of numerous works on Latinos and U.S. films and film history, including the work uh, Latino Images in Film, Stereotypes, Subversion, and Resistance, and as well as the work uh, Cinema of Solitude, a Critical Study of Mexican Film, 1967 to 1983. He was recently appointed to the National Film Preservation Board of the Library of Congress and was a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow. In addition to being a top-notch scholar, he is an award-winning teacher. Uh, among his teaching awards are the Freer, uh, Friar Centennial Teaching Fellowship, the Piper Professor Award, um, which is awarded by the Minnie Stevens Piper Foundation for, quote, outstanding academic and scholarly, scholarly achievement and for dedication to the teaching profession, end quote. And the Chancellor's Council Outstanding Teacher Award, and most recently he was a recipient of the Board of Regents Outstanding Teacher Award uh, in 2009 and was named one of the University of Texas's top 10 great professors in June 2011. Uh, in the June 2011 issue of the University of Texas Alumni Magazine. I would probably wage money that you've exhausted all the teaching awards in the state of Texas. Um, and so we're glad that we can welcome you to DC, uh, a distinguished scholar and a distinguished teacher. Please help me welcome uh, Charles Ramirez Berg. Thank you so much, Conrad. Um, very generous of you. And welcome, everybody. Um, uh, just let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm from El Paso, uh, born and raised, um, then went to the University of Texas um, uh, and got a couple of graduate degrees and then was lucky enough to stay. And um, <clears throat> this is one of the topics that I, uh, that I teach and, and do research in. Um, and um, so, so um, it, it, let me just give you an overview of the Latino stereotypes in film uh, to kind of kick off this collaboration or this kind of uh, interweaving of um, Asian and uh, Latino uh, representation and populations in, in the U.S. And um, as I, so I'm going to be focused on Latinos, but I just want you to know, let me tell you what I tell my students, uh, you know, when at the beginning of this class, and it's... Um, we will be focusing on Latino imagery, um, the representation of Latinos, but um, in, in terms of uh, the dynamics of the process of stereotyping of those at the margin, um, you can substitute, um, I would say, just about any group that you like um, there. 
And so, <clears throat> you, know, if, uh, you know, what I'm saying, I think, applies to other marginalized groups that have been stereotyped, and that's all marginalized groups. So Asians, but Irish, Jewish, Italian, et cetera, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> let me um, just jump in uh, and see if I can't um, give you a quick kind of overview. Um, uh, and the first thing I need to do is just define stereotype, uh, because my whole talk is based on what a stereotype is, and this is my definition of a stereotype. And uh, I tried to get somebody else's definition um, 25 years ago when I was starting this, um, but uh, there's a lot of debate uh, about what a stereotype is, and I realized I had to make up my own definition. So here's my definition of what a stereotype is that I'll be using um, this evening. <clears throat> it's a negative generalization. Uh, made by one group, and that's the in-group, or us, uh, about another group, the out-group, or them. Okay, So it's a negative um, representation by one group about uh, another group. Okay, And it sets up this us and them kind of um, worldview. Um, so if you think of it kind of in graphic terms, um, you know, there's us and there's them, okay? And, um, you know, uh, this seems to happen in just about every society, okay? There's insiders and outsiders, okay? In the history of the United States, the insiders have tended to be Anglo-European Americans, and the outsiders tended to be immigrants um, that came after that, okay? Um, so you can talk about the center and the margin as well, Okay, um, and one thing to keep in mind is uh, stereotypes go both ways. Okay, so that um, uh, I will be talking about the way the center stereotypes the margin, but the margin also stereotypes back. Okay, and sometimes in in self defense. Okay, so and that's where um, you get things like you know white men can't jump and white men can't dance and all of that. Okay, it's the margin kind of reacting back uh, uh, and, and stereotyping the center. So while stereotypes can go from one group to another, um, in the mass media, which is our interest tonight, um, what tends to happen, because the center is where uh, the power, the wealth, the dominance, and the influence comes from, okay, um, mass media tends to uh, go only one way, okay? Because to be um, working for Paramount Studios or MGM or CNN or NBC, uh, you have to be in the center and you pretty much have to adopt that, um, that world view, okay? And then you look at the world from the center out towards the margin, okay? So that's one way to think about stereotypes. This world created us and them. Um, Another way to think about stereotypes is um, the center is defining itself and it's defining the margin as well. But it's about identification, okay? And it's a way that the center identifies itself. So if you think about um, the center identifying itself with a whole range of categories. Um, so I'm asking you to memorize these, and there's going to be a quiz at the end of the No. Uh, but just look at, you know, it's basically saying this is who we are, OK? Uh, we are clean. We are healthy. We are moral. We are honest. We are truthful. We are good. We are righteous. That's us, OK? That's who we are. And they are everything we are not, OK? So another way to think about stereotyping is um, it is part of the process of identification, of self-identification and other identification, okay? So we say who we are and they are everything we are not, okay? Um, so whatever they are, we're the opposite. Whatever we are, they're the opposite, okay? So if we're clean, they're dirty. If we're moral, they are amoral, okay? Et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's another way to think about stereotypes, that it helps groups identify themselves and it helps the center identify itself. It knows what, what we are and what we are not, okay? Now, if you look at the list on the right, the marginal uh, attributes, um, once again, thinking about stereotyping as something that happens to groups at the margin from the center's depiction uh, vantage point. Um, that's a long list and it goes on, okay? There's more to that list than, than what I have up there. 
um, you can think about stereotyping as um, creating clusters from that list and applying those to various uh, stereotypes, okay? So I'm gonna be talking about six basic Latino stereotypes, okay? Um, but one of the things I thought about as I, you know, as I've been working on this for a long time is um, you need more than one stereotype because you've got so many negative attributes to distribute. So you get a cluster and that becomes one stereotype and then you get another cluster and that becomes another one and uh, it'll take, you know, about six to cover the long list that you need to cover, okay? And by the way, um, you know, these characteristics at the margin are, are pretty um, consistent across ethnic lines, okay? So Irish, Jews, Italians, Asians, etc. okay? Get the same treatment. Um, African Americans, and the list goes on and on, okay? Um, so um, here's what I did when I started working on this. I um, started watching a lot of movies, which for me is fine, because I love watching movies. And I was looking at American cinema all the way back to the silent era and trying to figure out uh, so what kind of um, representation was it that Latinos had in American films? And not all of it was negative, okay? There were cases where um, you could tell the filmmaker was trying to give um, Latinos a fair shake and depict them honestly, fairly, and those kinds of things. So it's not 100%, but a great deal of the depiction was stereotypical, okay? And then I started seeing patterns, and um, I came up with six basic stereotypes, okay? So let me um, just go through them very, very quickly and give you some examples, and um, you'll know uh, what those six stereotypes are uh, in film, okay? So the first one is the Mexican bandit, uh, El Bandido. And um, before I describe him, um, maybe you could help me. Can you describe the Mexican bandido? Just, just describe him. The, you're looking at him. Tell me what he looks like. Yeah. Sombrero. Sombrero. So far, so good. Oh, uh, what? Mustache. Okay. What else? Dangerous. Dangerous. <laughs> okay. Aggressive, right? Okay. What else? Tattoos, Tattoos are good. What else? Kind of goofy, right? Not, you know, not the sharpest uh, knife in the uh, drawer. Yeah? Dark skin, swarthy, yeah? What else? Huh? Armed. Harmed? Armed. Armed, oh yeah, yeah. Um, rifle, pistol, knife, okay. What else? How's he dressed? More about how he's dressed. Poncho is good, okay. What else? Yeah, dark, dark clothing. Um, how about the bullet belts? Okay, yeah, the bandoliers, yeah. Uh, and sometimes there's two of them, so that X marks the bandido, right? Uh, <clears throat> but, excuse me? Untidy, Untidy messy, uh, sweaty, uh, right? Um, a scar is good. A gold tooth is good, right? Okay. Um, now, think about what we just did. I didn't say, think about this movie, or think about this actor, or think about this scene. I just said, describe that image, okay? Now, Somewhere you had an image that you were referring to. And my question is, where did you get that image? Okay? And my answer is, either we all come hard hardwire with El Bandido stereotype from the factory, okay, or we learned it somewhere. And I'm betting we learned it somewhere. And I'm betting that somewhere is you know, popular culture, you know, media. Okay? So he looks a lot like this, right? And here's Alfonso Bedoya in probably, you know, probably still the most, even if you haven't seen it, you've heard, you know how this goes, right? Uh, and I'll show it to you. But this is Treasure of the Sierra Madre, Hollywood film made about uh, some Americans down on their luck uh, who go prospecting for gold. And of course they find gold, and as soon as they find it, this guy shows up, okay? So let me show you, uh, Gold Hat is the way he's referred to. Let me show you uh, the introduction of Gold Hat. Vengan acá todos, vengan a ver esta palomita que me encontré en su nido. <risa> Está echadita. Oiga, señor, we are federales. You know, the mountain police. If you're the police, where are your badges? Badges? We ain't got no badges. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Okay. 
Uh, like I say, you've, you've heard that even if you haven't seen that clip, okay? Um, so, um, El Bandido. Um, he's, you know, he's not to be trusted, he's violent, he's aggressive, he's criminal, he's immoral or amoral. Um, you know, he's, he's just bad news, okay? Um, and this is a, a good lesson uh, for a couple of reasons. And one reason is, it, you know, if you just watch, you know, this 25 second clip, it's a perfect example, all right? And this is one of the things I, um, I tell my students, okay, that to, to be careful, okay, because if you watch the whole movie, and some of you have seen the whole movie, and if you haven't, you ought to see it. It's, it's amazing. Um, the whole movie um, is a lot more complicated than that 25-second clip, okay, because John Houston, what John Houston does is he gives you uh, the entire nation of Mexico, and so you see more than bandits, okay, and you see more than gold hat and you realize it's a very complex society. Beyond that, the film is about three Americans who are in Mexico to take Mexican gold away. So it's about the first world exploiting the third world for the third world's resources. And furthermore, it is about the greed of the first world characters, and they start getting you know, a little paranoid once they get the gold. And one of them goes crazy. Okay, so it's about greed, you know, um, for third world resources, you know, driving um, the first world crazy. Okay, so it's really a critique of those relationships. Um, and so what I tell, you know, students is you got to watch the whole text, okay? You can't just take 25 seconds out and say you've got it. Uh, it's a lot more complicated. So um, anyway, El Bandido, um, the kind of... Um, you know, the, the bandido, we don't have a whole lot of westerns anymore. So there's a lot of um, uh, bandidos uh, in the present day. Uh, and they end up being, you know, drug runners or they end up being uh, homeboys, uh, gang members who they are always from East L.A. Um, and all that has changed is the exterior costume, okay? Behavior is exactly the same. Value set is exactly the same, okay? They have not changed uh, in terms of who they are. Uh, as characters, okay? Um, <clears throat> the kind of female counterpart to that is the harlot, and sometimes half-breed harlot, okay? And she is, um, represents kind of the sexual threat, and she is present in movies to tempt the Anglo protagonist um, away from, um, you know, the Anglo, um, you know, love interest, right? And if she can do it, okay, she will cause the Anglo to, you know, uh, to lose his morality, okay? And the threat she represents is she, if, you know, if, if she gets together with the Anglo hero, they will produce the worst of all possible things, a half-breed, okay? And I am a half-breed, okay? So uh, I don't think it's so bad. But in the movies, it's really bad, okay? Uh, and so she is the temptress to dragging him to you know, the dark side, okay? Um, I want to show you an example from a more recent film. This is Six Days, Seven Nights, um, and this is the harlot figure. And one of the things about um, this figure is, you know, they're, they're man crazy, they're man hungry, they're man eaters, and if they don't, and they need to have an Anglo man, okay? And so if they lose man A, they just find man B. I mean, it's just, they just need a man right away. So um, <clears throat> if, if, I don't know if you know this story or not, but um, the couple in the back, David Schwimmer and Anne Heche, are, um, you know, have been, have flown to a, a desert resort uh, to, um, you know, celebrate their engagement. Um, the couple in the front, Harrison Ford and uh, Jacqueline Obradors, um, are, um, you know, they're the pilots and uh, they're a couple. Um, Harrison Ford has to fly Anne Hesch back and, um, by themselves and then they, uh, they have trouble and they have to land uh, on an island and nobody knows where they are and they might be dead and all of that. So David Schwimmer and um, <coughs> uh, Angelica um, have spent the day looking for them and they can't find them. So this is the end of that long day. Uh, and just watch the way that the harlot um, acts, um, even though, you know, her, you know her, her boyfriend might be dead or is in serious trouble. This is how she wants to spend the night, okay? I'm, I'm 
just going to take a shower, get into bed. Are you okay? I'm good. Yeah. I mean, do you want to stay here tonight? Stay? Yeah, with me. I mean, you probably think I'm being slutty or something, but I'm feeling bad and you're feeling bad and i really like for you to stay. I, I, I just don't... Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, yeah? <laughs> no, no, I can't. I mean, I'm, I'm still clinging to, to hope. And if, if I, I mean, if, if we, you know, if we Holy... No! No. N no, I... Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I see him leaving the room. How many of you think he's really going to leave the room? Okay. All right. So, of course, he doesn't leave the room, and he's tempted this man, and, um, and they spend the night together. Okay. So, uh, so that's the first group, El Bandido and the Harlot. Um, you can think of the six stereotypes as three pairs, okay, of characters. So let me move into the second pair. Uh, and actually, Angelica is a good example of the female uh, of the second pair, uh, the female clown. And the second pair are the comedy or the comic pair, okay? Uh, and they are the childish um, uh, characters um, that are meant to be laughed at. And their big flaw is they don't get dominant culture, okay? They don't speak the language very well. They misunderstand the culture. They don't understand how the society works, and they keep making uh, mistakes over and over again. And let me show you how, by the next morning, she has transformed from the harlot uh, into the female clown. And she has, just doesn't quite understand um, how, the society, you know, how the dominant society works. And so they've spent the night together, and this is the morning after. What is it? What's wrong? Angelica, the helicopter is going up in 20 minutes. If uh, you're going, beat, huh? Jeez, I didn't realize it was... Okay, thank you, Philip. Tell them I'm on my way, okay? Oh. Metele, pibe, vamos. The helicopter is going up in 20 minutes. Oh, God, what did, what did I do? And how many times did I do it? Are you okay? Huh? No, no, this was wrong. This was all wrong. Excuse me, how could you say that? No, no, I mean, everything you did was very right. But what I did was wrong. This is wrong. No, no. It's just we're going through a terrible ordeal. It's like when after a funeral, yeah? everybody has sex. Not everybody. No? No. Hmm. Okay. So she um, misreads uh, the dominant culture. Uh, and that's the joke, okay? Um, the, the, the male uh, variety is the male buffoon. And a good example is Leo Carrillo's um, Pancho and the Cisco Kid. Um, some of you may remember that. But uh, his job, week after week on this series, was to mangle English and to be kind of the childish uh, sidekick. And he was always getting English wrong. And instead of saying, let's go, Cisco, he would always say, let's went, and et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, Ricky Ricardo, when he gets so upset that he runs out of English, okay, um, is a good example. Okay, and then he just all he all he can do is Spanish, and there's just this you know uh, this torrent of Spanish comes out, and and that's important because in American cinema, English is the language of rational discourse, and so once you leave English, you leave rationality and rational discourse and rational behavior behind. Okay, so these are all examples of of they're they're they are made to be laughed at. Okay, don't take them seriously. They're like children, you know, just uh, don't worry too much about them. Um, there was a, <clears throat> um, a famous um, uh, ad campaign 
uh, in the late 60s and early 70s that kind of took advantage of this. Uh, and it was for uh, Frito's corn chips, and um, it was the Frito Bandito, uh, which was very successful. Uh, and even though there were Hispanic groups that lobbied against it, um, it, it was doing fine for Frito-Lay, and so they just kept doing it. Just let me show you some of their ads. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see, but down here towards the bottom, Um, this one here, um, it, it's calling out to kids um, to get their free coloring pencils, okay, in specially marked uh, boxes of uh, fritos. Um, and, um, and there's a contest, and I, I, you probably can't read it, but uh, grand prize is a trip to Mexico. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, they are made to be laughed at. And the reason you laugh at them is because they don't get dominant culture, okay? The last pair um, is um, the very sensual pair of uh, the Latin lover and the dark lady, okay? And the Latin lover was popularized um, <clears throat> by Rudolph Valentino, uh, who was actually Italian, uh, but a big uh, you know, star in, uh, in Hollywood in the early 20s. Um, and played a couple of roles as uh, Latinos. This, uh, he was an Argentinian in uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, and this is the, the film that made him a star. Uh, he also played uh, Latino in Blood and Sand. He was a bullfighter. Um, and I want to show you uh, just a couple of seconds from uh, one of the, the dance scenes. There always was a dance scene. Um, and, and the thing with you know, the dark lady and the Latin lover, is um, they are different from the previous four stereotypes. They're very well educated. Um, they probably speak English. Um, they are very um, handsome, beautiful, uh, very alluring. Um, however, the difference is their sexuality is very mysterious. And on the one hand, that makes them very attractive. On the other hand, that's what makes them different, okay? They are not like us because their sexuality, something about it is just different from our sexuality, okay? Um, so let me show you, um, there's this, this is the moment I wanna show you where uh, he's dancing with this woman in a cantina and uh, right as they're about to kiss, I'll show you this. Okay. Um, so, just as they're about to kiss, uh, he throws her to the ground, okay? So, um, and that was it. I mean, there's something very mysterious. There's some danger there. There is some unpredictability to his sexuality, okay? And that is, on the one hand, very attractive and what made him a star. On the other hand, what makes him dangerous and unpredictable and other, okay? They are not like us. Um, let me show you um, a, a, a more recent, although still, um, you know, uh, from Hollywood's golden age, uh, example of the Latin lover. And uh, here's Lana Turner, um, whose character is in Brazil, um, and she's accompanied a friend who's a horse trader, and the friend is um, wanting to buy some horses, and he's off looking at horses, and she just kind of um, whiles the time away and walks into this uh, stable. And... Um, uh, and we will be introduced to um, uh, the character played by Ricardo Montalban. Um, so this is from Latin Lovers, uh, 1953. Thank you. 
Okay, so she she's, must be in Latin America, right? Um, okay, let me just show you the, uh, the dark lady, which is the female uh, equivalent of uh, uh, the Latin lover. Um, she is dignified, she's aloof, she's mysterious, she's alluring for all of those reasons, okay? Um, and that sexuality sets her apart. Uh, particularly from Anglo women. So let me show you. Uh, this is Dolores Del Rio, who was Mexican, um, came to the U.S. and had was a superstar in the 20s and early 30s, and then returned back to Mexico with the coming of sound. Her career um, took a bump and uh, returned to Mexico and then was a superstar in the Mexican cinema as well. Um, this is one of the Hollywood sound films that she made, and it's called Flying Down to Rio. And she plays um, a Brazilian woman. And obviously these characters are upper class, well-educated, wealthy, well-to-do, um, um, you know, very good looking, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, so here's, this scene is in a nightclub in Miami before we fly down to Rio. And um, every uh, Anglo woman in the nightclub is trying to get the attention of the handsome band leader. Okay? And everybody wants um, to be noticed by him. And she is going to say, uh, I can do it just sitting here at this table. From here, I can get him to notice me. And the other Anglo, her Anglo friend says, uh, say, okay, show us how you're going to do that. So this is a scene where um, she um, gets him uh, to notice her and to ask, you know, uh, and, to, and get him out on the dance floor. So this is from uh, Flying Down to Rio. Um, the, the second, the, you know, the, the assistant band leader is played by Fred Astaire in his first film, so uh, watch for that. So, um, here's Dolores El Rio. If a Brazilian girl was half as interested in him as you are, and had half your freedom, she'd, uh, she'd what? She'd get him over here, just for you. Oh, yeah? You mean she'd try? What is he doing now? He just fell into the trombone. Better have a heart, Fellini. You break up the whole orchestra. Whenever a Brazilian girl starts something, she must finish it. Yes, madam. Pencil. Yes. Thank you. dog food. Customers. And it was the kind they made out of fish. It's a bum. For you, sir, from the lady, sir, the dark one. After all, look at her. What have I got to lose? Only 20 jobs. Since when is dancing a familiarity? It's a formal resignation. Listen to what one of the women at the table says about the Doris, the Doris of Rio Uh-oh, she's smiling at him. What have these South Americans got below the equator that we haven't? Okay. So what do they have 
below the equator that we haven't. And that's the, that's the difference, okay? They have something mysterious sexually that we do not, okay? Um, so let me just wrap up very quickly. Um, just <clears throat> suggest a couple of things uh, as, I, as I conclude. And one of them is the other possibility for the Anglo band leader is the Anglo blonde played by Ginger Rogers. Um, but <clears throat> she is um, not worthy of him. Okay, and you can tell by her dress, okay? It's translucent, you can see through, uh, it's low cut. If you compare her costume with uh, Dolores Del Rio's costume, you realize that she is uh, the floozy, right? She's the promiscuous blonde, and uh, not anything like, uh, and even the color, okay? White and uh, black or you know, dark um, dress tells you um, that she's not good enough for him, right? Uh, and so um, one of the interesting things about stereotyping is the dominant group stereotypes others, but it also stereotypes itself, uh, which to me is really interesting and just shows you how insidious stereotyping can be because, um, you know, the easy blonde, uh, the dumb jock, the country hick, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, these are stereotyped, and if you think about it, going back to uh, this diagram that I had, um, it is in a way kind of boundary maintenance. It's basically the center speaking to itself and saying just because you're Anglo doesn't mean you can't go beyond the pale. Uh, and so be careful, okay? And in this particular universe of this film, Flying Down to Rio, the upper class Latina, played by Dolores Del Rio, is actually closer than the promiscuous blonde. Okay? And so you realize just how, as I say, insidious uh, stereotyping can be. Uh, and finally, let me just say that um, how in, in the big picture, how do we fight against stereotypes? Information. The more information we have about others, uh, the more you realize there's exceptions to, you know, if, if you don't know any Italian Americans, you might think they're all in the mafia, okay? And then you meet some and you realize they're not all in the mafia. And the more exceptions you have to make, the more likely you are to discard the stereotype because it's not a category that works for you, okay? So why would I you know, even have that category, okay? Uh, in movies, I think uh, stereotyping is overcome by just hard work, okay? I think it's just lazy filmmaking. Um, the way to overcome stereotyping is just to write better scenes, um, you know, have better direction, uh, have better actors, um, you know, playing better, better written scenes and better uh, directed scenes. And so I don't have a time to show you this. Maybe I can show it to you later. But uh, this is one of my favorite movies, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, this scene is an amazing example of how a scene that could have stereotyped uh, uh, Luis Guzman uh, did not, and it, it did not, it avoided it because it was so well written, so well acted, and so well directed. Okay, so let me get out of here, but thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. That was um, a great introduction to uh, the topic this evening. And as you know, we are um, taking into account that uh, imagery and representations take across different genres and different cultural fields, uh, which leads me to the introduction to our next speaker. And let me begin uh, just with a personal story. I mean, a couple years ago in, in Austin, uh, no less, uh, the next uh, speaker, Lisa Nakamura, had received a, a book award from the Association for Asian American Studies. And I was you know, in, in a group uh, waiting to congratulate her. And, uh, and, she's, and she paid me this great compliment. She said, hey, Conrad. And so I thought, she knows my name. It's like a, she's a rock star. 
Um, Lisa Nakamura is the director of the Asian American Studies Program, professor in the Institute of Communication Research and Media and Cinema Studies Department, and professor of Asian American Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She's the author of Digitizing Race, Visual Cultures of the Internet, a winner of that t uh, 2010 Association for Asian American Studies Book Award. And she's also published Cybertypes, Race, Ethnicity, and, and Identity on the Internet, and a co-editor of Race in Cyberspace, and the forthcoming Race After the Internet. She's working on a new monograph, tentatively entitled Workers Without Bodies, towards a theory of race and digital labor in virtual worlds. Uh, her work um, is, I think, uh, groundbreaking in the field of Asian American studies and definitely when it comes to notions of identity and the internet. So please join me in welcoming Lisa Nakamura. Well, what a nice introduction and what an excellent paper by Professor Berg. Um, I think it is really important to think about stereotypes in media and this is one of the reasons why people have so much hope for digital media, because the thinking is that people have more access to representation of themselves. We're less likely to see really pernicious stereotypes, um, such as the bandido and the dark lady and so on. Um, and I was also glad that he finished with, he's just not that into you, because that's a movie about social networking, right? About how every aspect of life, especially romantic life, but every aspect of life, work life, educational life, is now really mediated by all kinds of digital forms and all kinds of mobile forms. So right now I'm shamelessly hijacking your attention by showing you this as a way to start off. Does anybody know what this is here? What? But yeah, that's right, lolcats, right? So I'm gonna be talking about Asian American digital media production um, in probably a little broader way than, than many people have so far because as far as I'm concerned, this is a Asian American this is a form of Asian American digital media, and I'm gonna explain why. So, excuse me for a minute while I back up into my slides, okay. So here's a, a picture of, of, I'm shamelessly promoting. This is the book that, as a co-edited book that's coming out this year. It's in copy edits, you can buy it on Amazon. It's already on sale, okay. So, <laughs> I'm the director of the Asian American Studies program at the University of Illinois, and I'm also a professor in the um, Media Studies Department, and I'm a professor of digital media. So, I have two different jobs, ethnic studies, digital media, which I think are two things that need to come together much more, partly because empirical studies show, um, there's a big study from the Kaiser Foundation that Ellen Wartella put online recently, I'll talk about a little bit, that kids of color from eight to 18 are spending four and a half more hours a day using screen media than their white counterparts are. That's a significant amount. And it's spread over all kinds of screen-based screen media like television, video games, SMS, mobile gaming, anything you can imagine. And many of these things are happening at the same time. So people are double screening a lot more or they're IMing and playing video games a lot. And so if we're gonna talk about race and ethnicity in the US, the national conversation on race is happening in these spaces. It is a public discourse that's happening in semi-public and private platforms like the internet. So I'm so glad the Smithsonian is, in, in its quest to do cultural preservation, is starting to um, look at digital media more because that is where our culture is happening right now. Um, the conversation about race is a vexed one in the US. It's difficult to have. So if we wanna see where it's going, we need to look in all kinds of spaces we're not used to looking at before. So as Charles was saying, we're in a, in a kind of bad way when it comes to the mainstream media and have been for a while, when it comes to representations of, of ethnicities, races, and gender, no doubt. And you know, obviously, queer people have had it hard too in the mainstream media. Uh, the good news is, according to the New York Times just last week, um, Asian Americans are using the internet to circumvent mainstream media and to represent themselves in less stereotyped ways. So according to this article, 87% of Asian Americans are online. Now I'm gonna qualify that by saying English speaking Asian Americans. That's how this study was counting Asian Americans, which is a pretty bad way to count people considering how many Asian Americans are not speaking English and are not answering surveys. So it's a little misleading. Also Asians are a pretty heterogeneous group South Asians and Chinese people tend to be in a very different SES than people from Cambodia, say, or Laos or other places. So it's a much less easy to stereotype group than, it, than we should be doing. 
But in any event, this is good news. Um, the title of this is for Asian Star's Many Web Fans, which acknowledges that stereotyping not only gives a false representation of what a given race or ethnicity is like, it also cuts work. It, it makes it impossible to get a job if you're an actor of color, because you're not only going to end up in a stereotype role, there aren't going to be very many roles for you, right? Vin Diesel's written about this a lot. He was kind of, he ends up, actually Vin Diesel plays a white guy now because he has such a hard time being cast in roles because of the narrowness of Hollywood. So the New York Times article says it's a leveler playing field for Asian stars online. It talks about people like Kev Jumba, who some of you might have heard of. He's the 12th most subscribed um, channel on YouTube. He's a comedian. Ryan Higa, Japanese American, is the second most subscribed YouTube channel. He has 4.1 million subscribers. So this looks great, right? This is a positive thing. Um, these people are all comedians. This lady is a makeup artist. Um, also, uh, <laughs> you might have heard of this website. I think this is hilarious. I met these two girls at a conference at MIT. If, if my mom is a fob. Um, as Charles was saying, when you see broken English in mainstream media um, for people of color, it usually means they're out in margins or dumb or unassimilated or inappropriate. However, my mom is a fob really celebrates English, right? <laughs> broken English. Um, and these are all images that users contribute. So it's a site for Asian Americans, by Asian Americans, and it's been turned into a book, which you might find at a place like Urban Outfitter, along with books like Things White People Like, which is another blog about race. It's got these really funny, kind of attention-grabbing um, bits in them. So this one, if you can't see it well, is somebody's grandmother is wearing a shirt that says, bros before hoes, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty typical. And here's what the book looks like. It's entitled, My Mom is a Fob, Fob meaning fresh off the boat, right? Um, Earnest advice in broken English from your Asian American mom. And there's also, my dad is a fob. So what this does is to repurpose the idea of broken English into a stigma, into signifying a kind of cherished form of difference, or form of difference which at least we can recognize as being about our own youth, our own childhood. It has its authenticity because it is user generated. It's people who are Asian, who submit these things. I wonder if their parents know they're doing it sometimes, because some of them are really, I don't know if they would think that's cool. So what this says is that humor is what drives traffic to new media, specifically YouTube. All these things are about humor. One is about makeup, but most of them are about humor. Um, Kev Jumba says, quote, I'll talk about things that Asians don't like to talk about, like race and sex. And he has his dad in a lot of the videos. Sometimes his dad cross-dresses. Sometimes he speaks in broken English. Um, but it's just a fact of the internet that if you want to get attention, and attention is the currency of digital media, humor is a really good way to do it. So it's a good story, it's, a, it's good news for people of color that the internet lets them participate a little more than broadcasting did or than Hollywood did, but there's a downside to relying on humor as a way to get in people's radar, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, also, as I said, I think expanding the idea about who's a new media producer or who is getting to control the media more, we need to look outside of just stars and representation and visual um, representation. Um, whose faces we see, sure we see more faces of color on YouTube than we saw on NBC, um, especially more um, Asian American faces. On the other hand, somebody like this, Ben Hu, is someone you might not have heard of, but you've probably seen images like this <laughs> and images Wait, that's the wrong direction. And images like that. So somebody made this one and, and sent it. Um, ben Hu is the owner of um, the Cheeseburger Network, which you might not have heard, but if you've ever looked at something like Fail Blog or Look, I Fixed It or <laughs> I Can Has Cheeseburger, Lol Cats, um, he gets 16 million unique visitors and has over 40 employees and owns 53 sites. Um, they're all humor sites. Uh, the original I Can Has Cheeseburger was started by Eric Nakagawa, a Hawaiian Asian American, and his girlfriend, who was also an Asian American, and later bought by Ben Hu. So he's an entrepreneur, right? This is another success story about the internet. Um, he is someone most people have never seen, but he's definitely a, a, a mover. He's a player in the world of the digital media, which is another opportunity that new media lets people have. Likewise, I don't know if you've seen this guy before, probably not. But maybe you played Plants vs. Zombies. 
<laughs> a really successful game, um, one of the most successful releases ever for the iPhone, sold more than 300,000 units in the first nine days. Um, you could say that something like Plants vs. Zombies belongs in the Freer Gallery. Right? It's definitely art. It's Asian American. A lot of people have seen it. It's really influential. It's a good game, but it's also a funny game. It's a really witty game, the way that the zombies die when you're shooting the peas. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I sound like an idiot, but believe me, it's really, really good, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. Um, and so Asian Americans are really working in kind of somewhat invisible roles sometimes when we talk about digital media. And this is really important because kids in particular are using a lot of video games. As I mentioned before, this study showed that um, all American kids are living their lives online much more than they ever did, but there's a color line there. There's a huge divide between minority youth, black, Hispanic, and Asian, and white youth. They're consuming, as I said, more than four and a half hours of media a day compared to white youth. Um, these differences hold up when you control for education, wealth, whether the kid's from a single parent or a two-parent family. So it's really not about class. It really is about race. Um, as the report says, Asian, black, and Hispanic 18, 18-year-olds spend three hours a day listening to music, an hour and a half playing video games, compared to about two hours a day listening to music and one hour playing video games compared to white youth. Asian youth spend an average of nearly three hours a day using computers. Hispanics just under two hours a day, African Americans slightly around there, and white Americans are somewhere in the middle. Um, so this is a fact. It's probably not going to get any less. It'll probably get somewhat more. And this year, my daughter's PTA distributed this pamphlet as we signed up for classes, and it's about the dangers of online gaming. It mostly tells parents how to set the controls on the Xbox, the Wii, and the PS3 so as to keep their kids from doing stuff like talking to strangers online, because parents don't know how to do that, right? So it gives you a step-by-step -step about how to use parental controls. Um, but there's also a section here about the dangers of racism in particular. So <laughs> this was written by a guy named Gamer Dad. And <laughs> he has his own website where he tries to help parents understand exactly what their children are doing when they have their headsets on and they're playing all these games, um, which are mostly unsupervised. He says parents should play games with their kids, but parents are not playing games with their kids for lots of reasons. They're busy. They don't know how to play the games. They don't want to play those games. They play Plants vs. Zombies instead. Kids are playing Modern Warfare or whatever. So um, what this uh, gamer dad tells people is that online games are like unsupervised playgrounds. And all kinds of things happen there that are interpersonal forms of stereotyping or racism. So when Charles is talking about this really pernicious Brandito stereotype, which is so persistent and just impossible to kill, um, that is mass media. And people know it's not addressing them specifically. right? It's not talking to them. But when you are playing a video game and someone sends you a message like this to you, that's a different kind of stereotyping, a different form of address than what you get from watching something like a Valentino movie or even you know, some of the um, you know, LA gang movies, right? And this is not uncommon. I took this from a website called Fat, Ugly, or Slutty. And it's a website that a bunch of women made because they were playing video games and finding themselves being called the same three things over and over again because most of the people who are playing a lot of these 360 games are men. And so they would find themselves getting unwanted text messages while they were playing multiplayer games, just like the ESRB says could happen to you. And so they decided to fight back by asking users to send in their own video and their own um, screenshots of what they were getting when they were playing online games. So here's a, a pretty typical one. And it's interesting, the only thing mentioned that is not mentioned here is Asian. <laughs> so it's kind of this scattershot approach to being offensive. Um, but this one definitely does, right? So this is part of an effort of women in particular, but you know, there's also queer rights gaming websites and so on that are trying to combat this really strong social disinhibition or a lack of control that people seem to have when they're playing online games. It's true they get angry because they're losing and so on, but there's also a lack of accountability when you're playing an online game. You can get away with saying or doing this kind of thing, um, whereas most people know you can't say or do this at the playground, you will get sent home, right? Even, you know, daughter, my daughter's school has a pretty strict no tolerance rule about saying stuff like this. So it comes out, it's, it comes out in other forms. 
So I don't believe this is just a problem for kids. I think this is a problem for adults as well. Um, Fat Ugly or Slutty is run by adults. So, okay, here's another one. And the, the conversation around this one was, how did he know you're Asian? <laughs> um, because the woman who submitted it was, and um, it's a good question. Um, if you choose a username, which I have a username, which is, signifies Asian identity, um, and therefore some people could say, I'm asking for that, right? Just like women who choose to wear, say, a veil and get yelled at or get stuff thrown at them are, quote, asking for it. And so the internet permits us to hide our identity, which many people saw as a way to get around stereotyping. Um, on the other hand, if you choose to represent an identity, you're seen as deserving what you get, which is very problematic and not what the internet is supposed to be doing. So I'm gonna talk really fast about an experiment by the University of San Diego's, UC San Diego's Department of Theater and Dance. So I'm just gonna play this really fast and talk over it a little bit. Remember Pearl Harbor. This is a free online video game, not yet complete, but there's a beta in release and a demo online. And it's called Drama in the Delta. It's a video game about Japanese American internment. It puts the user in the position of a girl who is being interned and being moved from one camp in Alabama, part of the materials come from the University of Alabama, to another camp in Colorado called Amachi. Uh, my mother was in turn in Amachi. So I was interested in this as an experiment. Um, this is a way to use edugaming, gaming as education, to reach young people and to help them get empathy by being in the position, at least visually or in terms of their gameplay, of somebody else. Um, however, as you probably know if you've ever had to play Oregon Trail, edugaming isn't all that attractive to kids doesn't necessarily teach them a whole lot. Sometimes people tend to laugh at it, and I have to wonder, is it really right to try to gamify one of the most shameful moments in American history? Part of what this game asks you to do is to run around collecting things in the internment camp and to hitch rides with friendly soldiers who are interning you so as to get your errands done. So it's not done, I don't want to trash it necessarily, I don't think it's gonna be very popular, because as I said, kids have an uncanny knack for knowing when you're trying to teach them something, right? But the idea of trivializing something like this by making it into a game, I think, is something we need to be really wary of. I know that people want to go where the kids are to do the education. We can't educate kids with paper and pencils anymore, all the time. It's just not gonna work, that's not what they wanna do, that's not how they think. On the other hand, the national conversation about race really maybe oughtn't to look exactly like this. Right. So to go back to the issue of humor, humor is a way to hijack the attention economy. It's a way to jump to the front of the line. It's the currency of the internet. That's how Asian Americans have managed to do so well on YouTube and on the internet. Um, on the other hand, humor can also work against you. It's not a position of politics. It's not really a position that allows you to strategize to do things in the world. It allows you to get attention. It doesn't allow you to do a whole lot more. Also, humor is something that people have used to justify racial stereotyping, right? So to use the N-word in a game and say, oh, it's humor, I'm laughing, you know, it's like Dave Chappelle, I'm just using it in a humorous way, is a way to disavow or to kind of disassociate oneself from the burden of understanding race or thinking about it a little bit more difficult, in a little more difficult terms. So one question we have to ask ourselves, how can racial minorities use the internet for non-humorous kind of topics, right, to do more political or more cultural preservation work? Or how can they deploy humor effectively in order to deploy the, um, to visualize the cultures the causes, the struggles, and the history of Asian Americans. Oh Thank you. Oh my goodness, I would be so, so I'll grateful. just stop this guy right now. Yeah. Okay. So I'll invite our speakers to come on the stage and we'll. Well, thank you. Those were just two very you know, fantastic uh, presentations. Um, I was tweeting throughout, so uh, <laughs> definitely trying to keep up, but uh, my fingers are not nimble enough. 
not that next evolution. Um, so, uh, you know, as I started out in the, uh, of the, uh, in the evening, I said one of the things that I'd like the audience to do is to, to think about that spirit of inquiry. Right? Again, we've gone through a whole cultural field, two large genres that are definitive of American culture and even world culture, that is to say cinema and the internet. And we've had two terrific scholars who have really rooted out um, how race, ethnicity, identity play, the, uh, play out in those two uh, you know, genres, those two canons. Um, I wanted to ask a couple questions uh, just to start the conversation and then I also wanted to open it up to uh, the audience. So um, again, like I said, uh, an invitation for a spirit of inquiry because uh, we have some renowned uh, scholars here who can answer uh, better than I can. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that you know always I think comes to mind uh, when you're doing uh, this work in identity is the question of persistence, right? How do these representations endure, right? And I think that both of you have, have given very good answers. I mean, one, uh, you know, Charles talking about the the, the craft of filmmaking as uh, a mass filmmaking is one in which commercialism rules out over more complex identities, right? That's the way in which it appeals to a broader audience. And, and Lisa, almost the same thing, in the sense that once we use, for example, the internet, and we use that as a form of a vehicle for representation, humor, uh, which is, again, a mass kind of appeal, uh, tends to be a way to sustain these representations. So I was um, curious as to how else these representations may endure or is it simply um, trying to be shift gears into more serious and more complicated filmmaking or uh, internet cultural production? Well, one of the stereotypes about Asians has always been that they all know how to use the computer, which is not true, obviously. Um, and so uh, the idea of the Asian nerd or the Asian Silicon Valley guy or girl who just knows how to do things is like this digital native I think is yet another stereotype that has been around for a while. You know, even in Star Trek, Sulu was an engineer. That totally makes sense to me now because you're supposed to be an engineer as an Asian American, you're told growing up. Um, but I think that, as you say, the stereotypes are really persistent. Part of what is interesting about humor is that it always is about playing with them. You know, taking stereotypes and doing something to them that's a little odd or twisting it a little bit, right? So someone like Kev Jumba takes stereotypes of immigrants and just you know, totally mocks his own dad, and his dad really likes it. Margaret Cho mocking her mother <laughs> is kind of a famous one. But it's, it's what's frustrating in some ways to um, white Americans when you're teaching a course about the studies, they say, well, how come it's okay when they say it, but it's not okay when we say it? You know, and so then you have to talk about that question pretty seriously and explain why it's okay, you know, what the difference is. Um, I think that internet humor by and for Asian Americans is, is really about stereotyping um, and trying to change those stereotypes. So part of why Kev Jumba is important is that American Girl went off the air and there has not been any kind of television program about Asian American families since that time. So when people want to know about Asian American families, they, they go on YouTube and they find stuff which is in some ways better and in some ways a lot worse. Right? Each episode's four minutes long. So there's not a ton that you can do in that format, and it's never going to be something I think that will end up, um, you know, in the Museum of Broadcasting. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe it will. I don't know. Um, in film, the stereotypes persist um, <clears throat> for two reasons. One, because of the society at large, but uh, within filmmaking, if you think about um, uh, how efficient a stereotype is. And a movie has two hours, more or less, and sometimes less, to tell the entire story. And so a stereotype is a very efficient sign um, that allows filmmakers to condense and eliminate a lot of stuff. So you have a scene, and it's in a cantina, and it's a western, and you have Harrison Ford, and in the corner is El Bandido. Um, the scene writes itself, right? There's going to be a fight. You know who's going to win. You know who's going to be the aggressor. I mean, the scene writes itself. You don't have to tell us anything about El Bandido's background. We know the background, okay? We don't have to establish anything. So, you know, you're working in a medium that costs 
$200,000, $300,000 a day to, you know, to make a film. Um, this is very efficient uh, in terms of money, finances. It's also very efficient in terms of narration, okay? Um, and Hollywood, as it developed, was very interested in being very clear to the audience and uh, abhorred ambiguity. And so a way, you had, the viewer had to uh, be able to identify everybody on the screen. That's a Jew, that's an Italian, that's a Mexican, okay? Uh, and therefore, you had this sign system that worked out, and, you, and, and they were so afraid that you were going to be confused that they had to indicate that's the Italian, and that's the Jew, and that's the Irish guy, okay? And that's stereotyping, okay? That had to do with the society at large needing to identify, okay? Um, you know, are you, you know, are you in the center, the margin, you know, Anglo-European, or are you not, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, it, it's this system of representation which is very efficient and very hard to work against. Uh, but I tell my students, um, many of them are in production and screenwriting, I tell them um, the way to, um, one of the ways to avoid stereotyping is go right to the stereotype, okay? You have that scene that I just described, go right to the stereotype and then figure out some other way to present that material, some other way to present that character, okay? And, um, you know, and think of all the different ways that you can do it. As I say, I think stereotyping is also lazy filmmaking. It's not very creative, um, you know, it's not very um, inspired. So I tell them, get inspired. You know, you can make that character, it can still be a fight, it can still have the same outcome maybe, but it could be a really interesting fight and that could be a really interesting character. And, you know, the scene that I talk about from, uh, he's just not that into you. Luis Guzman has one scene in the whole movie, and it's two minutes long, and it was written in such a way that it avoids the stereotype. It's amazing. It's like a lesson in how to avoid stereotyping. So it can be done, and it just needs time and attention and a little sensitivity about representation. You know what's interesting with both your answers and also in relation uh, to, to the presentation, both of you say, something similar, which is in the field of representation, there's a sense of instability in that sign, right? That it cannot be fully complete, the meaning of a particular stereotype. It can be, for example, inflected, reappropriated, right? Mm -hmm. It can be in use of empowerment when it was a symbol of oppression. And I'm curious, in your, in your research, what, what kinds of um, unstable signs, those, those signs that that you've come across that explode that kind of meaning, right? That, you know, you may at your, you know, sort of first encounter with it feel that's offensive or that plays into the one of the six stereotypes or, uh, you know, that's just not something that uh, is representative or accurate or proximate. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious if you could share a couple of those examples in which, wow, it, it, on the outside, it seems to uh, be this more of the same. But over time, because of the nature of representation, it transformed. Well, just to mention, I think, a couple of them. And one of them is humor, you know, so that if you take what looks to be a standard stereotype and then turn it upside down or inside out or have fun with it, um, that's an interesting ploy because it takes you into and you think you're seeing the stereotype and then you realize, oh, no, they realize um, that um, you think it's the stereotype and they're going to do something else with it. Um, Lisa mentioned another one where, um, you know, you, you take the stereotype and then you reappropriate it for a different use altogether. Um, I think that's another possibility. So, you know, humor, uh, parody, um, appropriation, uh, you know, taking this and, you know, so if you go online and look at, uh, you know, Frito Bandido, there are Latinos who have taken that and kind of redone it. Uh, and remixed it in interesting ways uh, to kind of make fun of it, okay? Um, I think if you have a character in a movie who, who recognizes that you think I'm a certain kind of stereotype, that's another way, you know, to kind of acknowledge we all are kind of thinking the same thing, but that's, that, that's not the Italian-American I am, that's not the Jew I am, that's not whatever, okay? Right. Yeah, I think Dave Chappelle, that was a really water, a watershed moment for um, race in America because people were confronted with these stereotypes in a way that made them really enjoy them but also feel very uncomfortable about enjoying them. 
and when he went on Oprah, I think he was not exactly in his right mind, but he did say <laughs> that he had decided to stop the show because when he was filming it, he was doing one of his pixie big gig you know, bits where he had this broad accent, and he saw a white, um, a key grip or a, you know, a worker standing behind him waiting to do something, and he was laughing, and he said he was laughing the wrong way. So he realized he hadn't done what he had wanted to do, which was to explode a stereotype or to put it in a different frame. Instead, it was so strong, it really had the same meaning it had before, and plus he was tired of doing the show. Um, I think another one I can think of is uh, um, the way internet memes work. So I've talked about English and the use of accents and dialect as stereotyping sometimes, um, but uh, if you're, Familiar with internet popular culture, there's a phrase, all your base are belong to us, which appears a lot in various forms of humor that you see. And at first you have no idea what this means. It's a line from um, a Japanese video game that was translated as they all were very badly into English. And so one of the lines is, all your base are belong to us. And so this went from being a kind of broken English thing to being the sign of cool insiderism in youth culture that if you knew what all your base or belong to us was, it meant that you were really pretty good with the internet, that you were really into anime, and you were cool. So it got re-signified as being a sign of insider status, um, just as a lot of Japanese popular culture has become that way. So to watch something like Avatar The Last Airbender and really care whether they cast black or white people or Asian people in those roles, um, that's kind of brought stereotyping into the youth, into youth priorities a little bit more. So I think that you know taking something like broken English and making it into a kind of statusy thing about insider media knowledge and kind of cool is another way that that's um, a, another way to explode it. Because I think Japan is really fetishized by a lot of young nerdy types. That's where the good music, not the good music, I think God no, but the good, <laughs> the good animation, you know, the good video games, a lot of the good digital culture comes from there. And that's not a good either. I mean, to fetishize something is to stereotype it in a different kind of way. But it has, I think, burst its bounds a little bit, as you say, and has become more about youth, global youth culture now. A kind of digital savvy or, um, you know, comfort in the digital world, which I'm suspicious of as well. I think it's really, um, still the case that a lot of young people of color do not have the internet. They don't have broadband at home. They tend not to have a computer at home. A lot of times use a library. So when we look at who's on the internet, I think we need to pay attention to that as well. Um, <coughs> poor neighborhoods don't have broadband. You know, they don't bother to build it out. They don't think, think that anyone's going to buy it. Rural neighborhoods don't have it either. So that's where all the YouTube stuff is, right? You can't get YouTube on your dial-up connection. You know, I'm enjoying the conversation because it, you know, it sort of dovetails with what uh, Ido and I were talking about earlier about trying to start the conversation. And in the nature of our work, a lot of what we have to do, th this has come a premise of what we do, is that representation in many ways is the meaning of which is overdetermined, right? So that you can't view a particular representation or object, as it were, without seeing it in some, for example, racial optic. Now, is, is that the case? I mean, it's really interesting if we were to, you know, following your, your talks, there's a certain premise, in as much as there's a premise of our programs, that representation is an act of meaning. Um, but are there cases where it's art or design, um, it's craft, it's something that's not overdetermined? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm question? just thinking about. Um, video games in particular, because sometimes they're not about representation, but about mechanics. <laughs> so it's not how things look, but how they behave when you interact with them that is really the meaning of those things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's not so big of a deal that some of the gaming women have really, really large breasts and tiny waists and don't look real. It's that they behave in ways that are stereotypical, but when you click on them, certain things happen that don't happen with the guys. Um, though the gaming industry has gotten better, you can now have a queer boyfriend or girlfriend in a game like Mass Effect 2. So that's new. You don't even see that on TV a lot of times. Um, but yeah, I think that representation has got to kind of limit the digital media, you know, because things, it's not always how they look at all. It's really more about the kind of mechanic or programming that goes into them.
So, yeah. Um, I guess I don't have a comment. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, here, here's... Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay, well, let me, let me give uh, an example, because this is something that I grapple with in my own work. One of the things that I think is shared between the visual culture of the internet, you use your title, and the visual culture of cinema, is that sense of language. And the basis of cinema language has been, for Hollywood cinema, uh, continuity editing. Right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the representations that endure is the performance or what have you. It's popular, it's easy, it's the stereotype. But the fact that people believe it, for example, is based on the craft of filmmaking, right? The way in which a, a camera choice is done, edited, uh, how uh, the lighting affects the character, the, the mise-en-scene, their costuming and the like, to give a sense of credibility. Now, when you watch that film, you're going to be entertained by giggling or, or what have you, and then you then give currency to the stereotype because it is sustained, right, as a piece of, whether it's fiction or not, it's a, as a piece of experience. Same thing on the internet. The, the types of apparatus at work on, in, in, you know, a par being participating in an internet culture is that sense of continuity, that sense of affectivity, that there are transitions or forms mm -hmm. of continuity editing with the clicking of the mouse, the way in which a, a website loads, um, and the like. And that's what builds that sense of currency. So humor is not so much slapstick, as it were, because that sometimes misfires, but credible humor right, is because of a performance that's put together, that's well put together. So that's where I'm, that, that's something that I'm, I'm trying to think about is, you know, sure, representations are, can be over-determined, right? So, but if we step back and say, look at the apparatus of cinema, for example, in this particular film, or, the, you know, the great examples, right? The, D, the, the, the Griffith, the D.W. Griffith films, right? Birth of the Nation, right? The, uh, you know, it, it reifies representations of African Americans because of these simple techniques that D.W. Griffith did by continuity editing, right? We, we, we are lost the representation is lost on us uh, because we're experiencing it. Same thing on the internet, we're just experiencing it. Uh, so that, that's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out myself. Well, I think uh, one thing is um, just the repetition of the stereotype. So stereotypes endure um, and, you know, so, you know, decades and decades and decades, the repetition of that. And even if you're not paying attention to that in this film, uh, you might 200 films later. Mm -hmm. um, and um, second thing is, I, I think there is a way in which continuity, Hollywood's continuity editing, okay, long shot, medium shot, close up, over the shoulder shot, uh, reaction shot, shot, reaction shot, all those patterns, um, <clears throat> composition, lighting, I think all of that has grown up at a time when the stars were mainly um, European Anglo-Americans, okay? And I think if you look at, so I'll, I'll pitch my book, um, Latino Images in Film, there's a, there's a chapter about, chapter two, which is about how uh, looking at a four minute scene from falling down, uh, in which if you just look at uh, how that scene was shot, and it was shot consistent with the continuity, Hollywood's continuity style, it favors the Anglo character. The Anglo character wears lighter clothes, is taller, is in the center. Uh, the Latino characters are on the margins, et cetera, et cetera. The, the lines they're given to speak, uh, the way they act, um, all of that uh, feeds into a representation, okay? And you almost can't imagine that scene being shot any other way, being acted any other way, um, being scripted any other way, okay? Third thing I wanna say is that doesn't mean that you can't break stereotypes. I don't think movies force you to make stereotypes. I think um, people's decisions as they're making the movies create stereotypes. And so if you wanna break out of a stereotype, there's a way to do it, okay? It, it's gonna take some time and you're gonna have to not cut the corners, you're gonna have to you know, work harder, think harder, create better characters, write better scripts, but it's possible. Okay, so I don't think just, just and, and this comes up in my classes because many of my students are production students and they say, well, sir, are we trapped in, by the medium and we have to stereotype? And I say, no, okay. Um, there, there's a way in which your characters do not have to be stereotypical, okay. They can be 
individual characters, not um, generalized characters, a negative generalization, which is a stereotype. So. Yeah, you know, the internet is an amazing development, partly because it does circumvent a lot of mass media. The woman who I showed you in that um, New York Times article is the top most watched blogger on YouTube, or vlogger, and she does makeup tips. And she was denied a job at the Lancome counter when she went to get one in her department store because she was Asian. So, you know, going around these kind of mass forums, um, the internet seems to be a way around <laughs> that, right? But if you watch these top-ranked Asian American um, people on YouTube, which is now TV, I mean, YouTube is TV, basically, for a lot of kids, um, there's nothing threatening going on there around race. You wouldn't see a top YouTube video about internment. <laughs> that is not going to happen. Instead, the University of San Diego, in, co you know, in conjunction with the NEH, which gave them a lot of money, over $100,000 of funding to make that game, um, is where that's happening. So you could say the tyranny of the industry was keeping people of color out of those main roles. They were always in the background, literally. But the tyranny of the majority is keeping people of color in very specific types of roles as well. So they get to be there. People vote with their feet on the internet, right? There's more than 500 channels. They can watch whatever they want. But what they want are non-threatening discussions about race. So that there is race to be enjoyed. There's difference to be had. You know, my mom is a fob. It's a hilarious site. I love it. I think a lot of people do. But there's no politics in that site. Um, there's maybe a really, really implied politics. But it's not that way. You know, Margaret Cho's biggest audience is gay men. I think because they appreciate her kind of transgressive attitude. Um, and there's some politics there, right? But if you're relying on a popularity system to decide what gets watched, you're not going to end up with some really kind of inflammatory or even really deeply historical racial content there. So that's the issue, right? We went from a system that was very top down, decided by these kind of Anglo American industry heads what to do, and now we have the commons. But the commons isn't in many ways that much more discriminating about it. Um, it will let race be represented, but it will be represented in very, very unthreatening ways. So. Terrific. I just realized time is getting away, oh. so I want to um, just maybe get a, a couple questions from the crowd if there are any. And any others? We'll go right there. Yeah. Since we're in DC, I'll ask a DC question, and that is to our two speakers what advice would you give to? job. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, we'll go in the uh, good question. <laughs> go in the <laughs> go in the, the back, the very back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think both. Okay, so so crash c is one model. Okay, so you know crash is an ensemble kind of protagonist that is not one single hero, but a story uh, a cross section of Southern California, and various groups are represented there, and uh, and you see how they interact, and so that's one model, and you get an insight into various ethnicities um, and uh, you know those societies and I think that's that's one good model because one of the ways to break with stereotypes is y if you can make the character an individual not a generalized sign for a group you're breaking the stereotype okay and all you have to do is spend some time there's a movie um, a Mel Gibson movie uh, called uh, Tequila Sunrise 20 years ago or something and um, <clears throat> Raul Julia played um, you know, the Latin American drug runner. And he was a Latin American drug runner, but he was so entertaining. 
He was so funny. He was so intelligent. He made him a character. He was still the bad guy, but he was this engaging bad guy. Okay, so that's uh, another way to go. Um, uh, the blockbuster, I mean, Avatar. Okay, um, you know, it's it's about others. That's a movie about otherness, and it's a movie about an Anglo character who realizes um, he has more in common with the others than with you know the Anglo's, uh, you know, the the Americans who are on this um, uh, you know on this planet. Uh, and, um, you know, Saldana, as always, Saldana plays one of the others, you know, and so, uh, and Michelle Rodriguez is one of the, the soldiers who, you know, who rebels against uh, the corrupt uh, officer. And so uh, we're already, you know, that's another way to go. It's a big budget way to go. But already, um, you know, James Cameron figured out, I need to have some of that representation. So I need Michelle Rodriguez. I need Zoe uh, Saldana in there, too. And already he's, you know, so that's another, another strategy, okay? And I think both will work. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. I'll go with uh, Ted. Okay. Um, yeah, I've been reading my Twitter. There's somebody from Racial Issues in the house today, right? Who's going to be tweeting this up? Or okay, all right. Um, so just happens, to be, just happens to be you. Yeah, that was a slide that didn't make it into this presentation. I mean, there's a bunch of slides by people like Angry Asian Man, Eight Asians, Racial Issues. Um, there's one called O Industry by Karen Tongson at UCS, USC. That's about Asian Americans in the media industry. So yeah, there's a ton of sites like that. The New York Times doesn't talk about those sites, though, because they represent no threat to television or to the mass media. And so they don't see those as being really important in the way that the media has been changed by the internet. But obviously, it is. Those sites have really much smaller readership. But you could say that they have probably been read by more people than have ever taken an Asian American Studies course, say, in the US. So that's a really important thing. I'm glad you brought it up, right? There's certainly people who are having serious political conversations. Um, just recently this year, people have been talking about the Arab Spring as being about the Blackberry, about Twitter, about the internet in some way, just like the Iranian Revolution two years ago. Um, yet if we look at the Twitter Revolution, it was a revolution for Twitter and not for Iran. So made Twitter very popular. Iran's pretty much the same way that it was. Um, I think these sites that are kind of Asian media advocacy sites, and there are ones for Latino media advocacy as well, are important, um, and they're filling an important role, I think. But from the perspective of, you know, the big, big picture, I think they're not seen as, as influential or as reaching as many people as, say, internet comics. So the ones I talked about, anyways, yeah. Um. And having to do with, so has anybody seen The Help? I haven't seen The Help yet. It opens tomorrow, so. Um, but, um, uh, you know, Blindside or something like that. I think you have to be careful when you make films like that because they can just be the story of a white savior who comes into the community and makes everything, you know, dances with wolves, okay? Um, Kevin Costner, you know, um, goes native and ends up taking their side and, you know, it takes him to kind of, um, you know, make a difference. So you have to be careful with that. But that is a trope that's been repeated in Hollywood for decades, okay? So go back and just think of all the Anglo heroes that had uh, sidekicks of color, okay? Uh, Rick in Casablanca, okay? Rick's sidekick, okay, is Sam. 
um, the African-American piano player. Now, why does he have an African-American piano playing sidekick? To indicate that he's a good guy and he's tolerant, okay? So he's not a racist. This is our hero. This is the way we identify our hero, okay? So you have to be really careful when you do that and think about that story that you're not just doing the same thing all over again. It takes a white man or a white woman uh, to kind of make a difference here. And you know they will enter that community and then that, is, well, that will be the catalyst that will cause effective and positive change. Well, thank you so much for sharing sure. your time with us this evening. Thank My you pleasure. for coming. And uh, we're pleased. Please join me in thanking Lisa and Charles.